Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the Stuart Quarry North Wales branch technical presentation by Dr. Liam Birmingham on the use of drones within the quarries. Yeah, sir. My name is Liam Birmingham. I'm a senior explosive engineer at EPC, and I'm going to be presenting to you to give you a presentation based on the use of drones in the quarrying industry. So this presentation, what I'm going to cover is photogrammetry. What is photogrammetry? Essentially, the principles behind how we can carry out drone surveys using photographs. How it's implemented for use of face profiling. And then I'll talk through the step-by-step -step process that could be followed in um, carrying out a face profile within the quarry using the drone. Then we'll talk about accuracy. And then towards the end, we'll I'll, um, then discuss other uses for drone technology within the quarry industry. So let's start basically with we'll start with photogrammetry. So what is photogrammetry? So this snappy little definition, photogrammetry says, is the science and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images. Um, it involves extraction of 3D measurements from 2D data. So essentially, it's the technique where you take a series of overlapping photos of the same area uh, or the same object from different known spatial locations, which can then be tied together and creating a 3D model from which we can then take extract 3D measurements from. It's not, it's not a new principle. In fact, we use it every day in our lives. By having two eyes allows us to have a gain depth, perception of depth. So I we'd be able to see the world in 3D because we're able to look at the same image from two different spatial locations on each eye. So it's the same principle. And again, it's been used for many years, been used over the years by the Ordnance Survey, where a series of overlapping photos taken by aircraft of known locations being able to overlap. And then by looking at these, each of these images, like this lady here is doing through a stereoscope, um, an image in each eyepiece, it's enabled to overlay the two photos together, which then creates a 3D image. From here, and this person is able then to draw in the contour lines along the land surface and creating our OS map that we know today. So the principle and procedures of um, photogrammetry has been in use for a number of years now, but now we're finally catching on with it in the um, quarrying industry and using it for surveying purposes ourselves. So how does it work? As I said it involves uh, overlapping of photographs. Um, Making create a 3D model. So photogrammetry okay. uses photos to make these measurements between objects and creates a oh, geometric okay. representation of the objects themselves. This then creates a 3D geometry by the multi linking these multiple photos together of the same object from the different spatial positions. So i.e. a vis visible pixel must appear or a visible object must appear as a single point in each image and these points are known as tie points and these links the photos together. So if you imagine a straight line drawn from the center of a camera to a pixel point in that photograph. Now with multiple images, so images taken at different locations of the same area, there'll be multiple lines and multiple points. So from these different spatial uh, positions, these lines will intersect from the overlapping photos. Now these intersection points will provide a 3D location. And, they, and these are then able to tie and link each of these photos together and creating a 3D model. And as you imagine, the more overlapping photos you have, improvement in accuracy. So in a nutshell, that's what photogrammetry is, and that's how we can use photogrammetry in our face profile techniques. So now I'll, I'll talk you through the, our, um, the workflow process of carrying out a drone survey and then inquiring our um, 3D profiles used for our blast design process. So before we do anything, as with all jobs now, we must carry out a series of checks and risk assessments. Our first check we must carry out is our pre-site survey check. Okay, this is a check that we must be carried out before we come to site to carry out the survey. Here we go through a series of checks. I hope we have landowner's permission 
brief description of the terrain. So we need to assess what the terrain is going to be like. Airspace, if, do we have permission to fly in that airspace? Say, for example, here in the middle of the Peak District, by looking at this air traffic map, we need to assess which air zone we are in. This is airspace G, so that's general, so it's good. But as you can see, from Manchester Airport further to the west, if a quarry is in this area here, we may run into a few restrictions on how we can operate our drone at what heights. So we need to assess that. And also any other local hazards, um, like uh, power stations, for example. And then we also need to assess any NOTAMs. These are notifications for airmen or women. So this could be like any particular activity going on in the area, like an air show or military exercise, for example. So we need to assess all these hazards and go through this checklist to make sure everything's okay. Then once we seem everything's okay, uh, it seems suitable to carry out a drone survey, we, we can attend site where we look at the area in more detail. So now we can assess where we're going to take off, landing areas, emergency landing and holding areas, for example. Yeah. Again, we can see where we need clearance with air traffic control, if we're near, operating near an airport, and our no towns again. Once we're happy with that, then we then carry out our pre-flight risk assessment. So this may include any information that we highlight or pick up in our checks, uh, pre-flight, pre-site checks or on-site checks but also our um, other risk assessments attributed to operating the drone normal. Once we've carried out all this, then we're, we're able, we're happy, and we can start to fly the drone. So what's our profile procedure? So we mark out the holes, uh, as we norm typically do if we're carrying out a laser profile, as you can see here, marked out all the points. But in addition to obviously marking out the holes, we need to mark or place down ground control points or control markers. And these will be used to geo-reference our 3D model. What it can simply be is a spray marks on the ground, as you can see here. Uh, typically, we go through at least three on the bench top and three on the quarry floor, just two in this photo, but out of this shot, there's another one for you there. So this allows us to um, geo-reference our model, but by taking ground control points at the um, the quarry floor and as well on the bench top, we're then uh, measuring the height and getting a good scale of the height of the model as well. And typically we want these spread out across the whole survey area, not just all dotted in one corner of where we're surveying. Once we've placed these down, we can then GPS these in using an RTK survey so we can measure the coordinates down to uh, a five centimetre accuracy. And these coordinates will then be uploaded later on in our cluster down process. Now we've done all that, we've done all our checks, we can now fly the drone. So obviously we need to carry out a visual inspection of the drone and obviously another final check of the area to make sure there's no one encroaching in our working area. And then now we can fly the drone. So typically we follow a grid-like pattern, as you can see on the right-hand side here, to survey the entire area. This helps to ensure that we get a good overlap of images. Typically, we want approximately about 70% overlap of, of photos, just so we've got a good, good number of uh, tie points, as I mentioned earlier, so it increases the accuracy of our resulting 3D model. We generally uh, fly the drone at approximately a height of uh, 30 metres with the camera in a vertical orientation, so pointing directly down. And then we fly over the entire area, not just the bench top where all the hole markers are, but over in the quarry floors around the three faces as well. So all around the general area. We find 30 metres is a good height because it gives us, still gives us a very good resolution. We have a 20 megapixel camera, which are fitted on the drones that we currently use, and which are typically fitted on uh, most drones these days. But it also allows us not... So if, if you end up having to fly at a lower height and you end up taking more photos, so it's more processing time and a longer flight time. So we find 30, 30 metres is, is a good height to fly. You could typically fly higher, but again, you start to lose resolution of your model. So once we've taken all our vertical photographs pointing directly down at the ground, we can then, then orientate ourselves in front of the face and take photographs at approximately 45 degrees to the face. Again, overlapping photos as we're strafing around the three faces. We then bring the drone into Landwatch, we take all these photos and then upload them into our photogrammetry software. Here's a screenshot of the software we use, Heavy Soft. 
uh, where you upload all your photographs and then the software then combines and links all these photographs together and creating a 3D model. This is just a short video just shows you, gives you an idea of the software used. So here you can see the locations of all the photographs taken for this particular survey. Here you can see all the photos and positions of the photos taken of the uh, three faces at approximately 45 degrees. And then the photos pointing directly down of the, the bench and tower area and quarry floor area. Then we end up with a 3D model looking like this with the, with the, uh, the textures imprinted on, onto the model as well. So as you, as you can see, um, you've got a great amount of detail um, in the 3D model of the, anything that's occurring on the face. Not in this case, but in some cases you may find it'd be like a clay band present in the face or heavy bedding joints or planes dipping out the face. So again, this, this would be picked up in our, in our 3D model here, which obviously is great use for a shot firer. So when he plans his uh, bus design accordingly, he can take that into account. Something that you would not get from uh, carrying out a laser profile. Also, another benefit we got here is that we're able to see a clear view of the toe area of the face and the, and the floor in front of the face, whereas you imagine this uh, toe bund in place around here it might be a lot more difficult to get the laser to shoot in at the toe area. So, as I mentioned before, we need to georeference the 3D model. So you can see here, these are our ground control points for this particular survey. So we've got four along the quarry floor, on the bund, and four on the, on the bench. So we've surveyed in uh, each of these points using a um, GPS, RTK survey. And now we're able to upload the, uh, the coordinates into our model. So now we geo-reference that model. So now every data point within this model is now has a, um, a coordinate assigned to it. And now we can, uh, we can also print off this brief uh, survey data report, showing you some of the information relevant for that survey. I, um, the number of overlapping photos of the area, as you can see here, a dark blue indicates over more than nine uh, images have been overlapped in this area, showing a bit overlap. We've seen the number of images used in the survey, 33. And also the resolution, so a pixel for every three and a half centimeters, and just under 100,000 data points as well in the survey. Now we're able to upload um, or export what we call an OBJ file, so that's a, a model file of our um, survey into a Blast Design software. And in this uh, OBJ file contains obviously three dimensional objects, which you see in front of yourselves, but also includes the 3D coordinates and texture maps as well, showing any geological conditions present on the face or in the area of the survey. Then we can then transform this 3D model and creating our 3D profiles, from which then we're able then to carry out our bus design process. So, what are the overall benefits of using drones for um, face profile? Well, generally, they're safer to profile using a drone than typical uh, laser profiling methods. Uh, you can carry out the drone survey from the top of the bench, away, segregated away from much of the uh, mobile plant on site, where you imagine typically with a laser profile, you have to set up maybe once, twice, three, four times um, in front of a face and where you could be interacting with mobile plant driving around in your area. So you remove that hazard by operating a drone from the top of the bench. You're also not having to load heavy equipment around like tripods and lasers as well. It can be a faster process than laser profiling. Don't get me wrong, if you only have to do one setup with a laser profile, that can be a quick process. But if you're involving multiple setups with a laser profile, there's multiple free faces to scan. The drone survey is a lot quicker. So your shot fire is on site and off site much quicker than someone with a laser profile. You're more, it's capable of accurately measuring faces in areas that could be inaccessible to a laser, such as large tow buns or material stacked up against the face or in front of the face. Or it could be some areas that's not accessible to get a laser so you end and have to scan the face from a very long distance away. So the drones uh, it sort of gets around that obstacle as well. And we can also capture the visual geological information. So we can see any bedding planes, we can see any clay in the face or anything that might be of interest. 
to the, uh, the shot firer. So that's all well and good, but what we need to know is whether it's accurate enough. So a few years ago now, uh, I think three, four years ago, EPC uh, carried out a trial working with Imris and the Camborne School of Mines down in Cornwall, just to uh, test to see if the use of drones for profiling is sufficiently accurate uh, for carrying out safe uh, profiles. So the field trial was undertaken at Imris in Cornwall, and the aim of the trial was to compare various techniques. So photogrammetry we're using a drone, with a standard uh, handheld camera, with a mobile phone camera, but more importantly to us, compared to um, two types of uh, laser scanners as well, which is commonly used on the market in the UK. Now all these various um, surveying techniques are compared against this machine here, which is a, a cloud, a commercial cloud scanner supplied by Campon Scholar Mines. This thing, piece of kit that's, uh, has the ability to scan down to a reduced uh, 25 millimeter by 25 millimeter grid, so providing a very highly dense uh, point cloud survey. So the trial was to identify an area of the face which would test all the uh, surveying techniques. So an area was um, identified face approximately 20, 60 metres in width and 20 metres in height, uh, fairly uneven. And here's some of the instrumentation that was used in the character survey. So the two laser scanners, drone so, as well. So these are the pictures that are taken from a standard handheld camera um, on the face using photogrammetry as well. These are all tied together. As you can see here, there are reference markers used for the handheld camera and the control ground control point there, the checkerboard, or the drone survey. So you can see, very undulating face, quite rough ledges in place, so it's a good test for all, uh, all the profiles. Here's the resulting 3D model uh, created by the drone. It was made up of 109 photos. It was taken in approximately 15 minutes. As you can see, the drone survey was able to capture all the information on the top of the ledge and down in behind that, that rock trap as well, uh, where it'd probably be difficult for the laser to look down into the rock trap and uh, I doubt it would have been able to capture any information on that ledge. On that ledge. So a common section of the face was chosen and extracted from each of the models. So from the drone model, from the um, laser profile models and from the camera models as well. And these were then compared directly with the Campbell School of Mine cloud scan using a software called Cloud Compare. So the, the point cloud uh, models from each survey were overlaid over the cloud scanners model just as a comparison. What we use a color coding scheme where green is a very good correlation with the cloud scanner. And when you start to get oranges and reds and dark blues, then it becomes less and less accurate. As you can see here with the drone, the very good correlation with the cloud scanner. Now with a mobile phone, as you probably expect, there's some bad areas here, with orange and red, and some dark blue areas here, which shows us gaps in the model where um, where the, uh, the, the mobile phone can capture these areas in more than one photograph. So let's uh, have a look at the information, the data, the results. Here we've got the, uh, this, the mean error and the standard deviation, all compared against the, the cloud scanner's uh, survey. You can see the cloud scanner recorded just under 1.7 million points in its survey, incredible high amount. But if we look down to the drone survey, we see even with a drone survey, using 104 photographs, we're still able to capture just under a million data points. And it seems to have a very low mean error compared to the, uh, the cloud scanner and a very low standard deviation as well. That's good. But how does it compare to the two laser scanners down at the bottom? You can see with the two laser scanners, they picked up fewer data points in the survey, so over 100,000 and under 180,000. And also the, the two laser scanners has a higher mean error and the highest standard deviation compared to the drone survey. So that's good. That shows not only does the drone survey offer several advantages in carrying out a laser profile, but it also seems to be on this trial anyway more accurate.
And here is to show the um, survey error distribution again, the zero being um, the cloud scanner, and anything that's tied as the error from the cloud scanner. We compare these against the two lasers in green and red. As you can see, there's a lot larger spread of error from the two laser scanners than there is from the drone survey. So we're, we're happy that the drone survey is very accurate and, the, and well more accurate than the laser surveys. So we're happy we can start using these now for our blast designs. In addition to uh, face profiling, there's also a number of other useful uh, uses for uh, the drones. One of them is for post-blast reviews and also post -blast, measuring post-blast performance. One of the brilliant things about drones is you can fly them up in the air and you can put them wherever you want to get a good vantage of any of the blasts you want to fire. Whereas with a, if it's trying to video with a standard camera, you're either trying to set up on top of on a tripod, which usually blows over in the wind, or you're trying to zoom in from a safe location hundreds of metres away on your mobile phone camera. So you don't get the best blast videos. So here you can see the quality of videos you get using a drone, and you can look and capture the whole blast without any obstructions in this way. So it makes a fantastic tool for reviewing every blast. As well as that, we're now able to actually measure blast performance. Whereas typically before, we've always taken a qualitative appro uh, approach to uh, assessing the blast performance by <clears throat> asking the shovel driver, excavator driver, how well it's digging, if it's better or if it's worse. Now we're actually starting to be able to put some numbers on it by using drone technology. So in this example here, there's going to be a video that's going to show you a model of a blast area. Okay, so two surveys have been taken of this area. So a pre-blast survey has been taken of this area. Each of these points here are reference markers dotted around uh, the blast area. And reference markers being placed in the positions where we think are uh, not going to be obscured by the, the map power once we fire it. You can also see the locations of all the photographs from the different drone positions for the model, looking down and looking at the face as well. So we're creating a 3D model like we were, have done in the past, we're carrying out a pre-profile or post-drill profile. And then once we fire the blast, we can carry out an identical survey again to this in the same area, picking up the same reference markers. So now we've got a 3D model before the blast and a 3D model is exactly the same area post-blast. And what we're able to do is able to overlap these two models together, compare them and measure the increase in uh, volume between the two models. And by doing so, we're able to measure a swell factor of the map power. So how much the volume has increased of the, of the rock after it's been blasted. So in this particular case, and uh, volume decreased by 40, approximately 40%. So it gives us a swell factor of about 40%. And this can relate to the diggability as well. So you get a higher swell factor, it's likely that the diggability is going to be better than a lower swell factor. So now we're able to carry out surveys and finally put a number to our blast performance. In addition to that, drones can be used um, to carry out a post-blast survey. So we can carry out fragmenta fragmentation analysis of the map power. So again, following the same procedures, taking overlapping photos of just the map pile, we can then upload this into a fragmentation analysis software, which then can calculate the size distribution visible in, in that uh, model. Um, the only downside to this is obviously you can only calculate the size distribution that's actually visible in the model. So with the material on top of the map pile. But however, it's generally this is the worst case scenario if a blast has gone well, as generally the oversize is present on top of the map pile, usually from the stemming area. This can provide us an indication of blast performance. And from this, you can, um, we can create a, a particle size distribution, which can be useful in to potentially tracking uh, oversize, for example. So say, 
don't know, uh, for your particular site, anything above one meter in diameter would be considered um, oversized, enough to be pecked. But we can track this. So we can have a look at this blast and say, oh, okay, 0.35% of, uh, of the material from that blast is oversized. Where, and then we can compare that to ne the next blast, the next blast, see if it's getting better or it's getting worse. So as well as using it for blasting purposes and measuring blast performance, another thing that is very, very useful for now drones is carrying out full site uh, quarry surveys, quarry mapping surveys. In this video here is a video of a winged drone. It's a fixed wing drone, which has VTOL capability, so it can take off vertically to a predetermined height, and then it can um, rotate horizontally and then fly over a given area, taking a succession of photos. And these are capable of surveying large areas um, in a relatively short time. They're ideal for mapping out a whole quarry. And this one particular one is equipped for a 42 megapixel camera. Uh, to put that in perspective, um, flying at a height of 120 meters would give a gives a pixel or every a data point every one and a half centimeters in the resulting model. So, what are the capabilities of um, carrying out these surveys? But the survey ca um, carried out follows the same principles. You need overlapping photographs. So, as you can see here, all these blue points here. Sorry, this is a quarry in there. Uh, Demo quarry in France. You can see the area that's being surveyed, slightly different to the surrounding area. This then could be uploaded into an online platform. Uh, these include uh, sites called Altier, which used to be known as Dell Air, if anyone's familiar with that. And also, um, Propeller is also commonly used in the UK. So, we need to carry out our survey. So, each of these surveys, because we're limited to flying a distance of 500 meters from uh, the pilots due to regulations from the CAA. Um, <clears throat> we have to carry out usually multiple flights uh, from different positions so we can cover our whole area. Now, these go will be pre planned um, on the software, which is provided by the manufacturer of the drones. And then the flights are automated, they carry everything out automatically. So you have to stand in there just in case anything goes wrong, we need to bring it back in. So as you can see here, all these blue points on the map. Um, show you the locations of each photograph taken by the drone. And if you see the orange points in between, these are ground control points. <clears throat> so like before, carrying out a face profile, we still need ground control points for carrying out the full quarry survey. And yes, we need them spread out all across the site as well, all on the boundary from one end to the other, and a few in the middle, at pretty much a very varying heights as well so we can get a more accurate um, elevation measurement in our model and here you can see a uh, black and white checkerboard this is what a typical ground control point uh, would look like when carrying out a full quarry survey it can be spray marks anything that can be visible in the model but you, you might see these around some sites and uh, that's what they're used for and again these are the use of georeference our resulting 3d model So once the survey is completed, you can upload all the photographs onto an online platform like this, and then you can create a 3D survey, something like this. So you, where you're able to zoom in, out, pan, or wherever you want, and look at any area of the survey in quite good detail. So <clears throat> what makes this different to um, carrying out quarry four quarry surveys in the past with a GPS? Well, in the past, when someone's carried out with a GPS, their survey of the quarry, typically this information gets fed back to our ge the uh, geological department or geotechnical department to where they can create their um, quarry development maps or plans, sorry, and then they issue them back to the, the quarry managers. However, that can still be carried out here in a lot more detail. But what's the benefit? What, what's the extra benefit of carrying out uh, surveys with drones and blown into an online platform like this is this survey is now accessible to every quarry manager or who anyone wants access to from just loading up their laptop and accessing it on their web page. It could be a great tool because you can make a number of measurements of the survey 
for example, here by simply drawing a line through the quarry here, we're able to measure the cross, uh, cross sectional area of these benches. So here you can check the face heights of the different benches, make sure you adhere into your quarry design plan. Now you can check your bench, bench widths, but you can also over, overlap it with um, a previous survey. And so you can see how far back you advance certain, certain benches, for example. And by overlapping previous uh, survey models, you're able to um, measure the uh, amount of material or volume of material that's been removed from the quarry or added to a tip. A number of other features such as whole, whole road measurements can be made. So the software, these platforms can automatically um, identify your whole roads um, and then can measure the gradients along each of the whole roads, the cross forms, uh, whole road whips. Typically you can um, upload which mobile plant you operate on site so it can then use that information to determine whether your whole roads need widening or, or wide enough or just wide enough for one-way traffic. And there's other features as well, such as determining or detecting your safety and high walls in, in the survey. So by using this feature, you, you can determine where your crest lines are for all your faces and your toe lines. But in addition to that, locations are your safety buttons, and it can tell you the heights of your safety buttons as well. So it, can, it gives you a visual representation of any areas of the quarry where you Safety buttons may be a bit low or your rock traps may be a bit low, for example. So it's a great tool for all quarry managers to be able to check their quarry as well as waiting for the survey data to come back to them for their quarry development plans. <clears throat> and in addition to that, as well as other features, there's also stockpile volume calculations that can be carried out using these, uh, these surveys as well. So just by selecting one of these uh, stockpiles, which are automatically detected by the platform, it can then provide you with a volume of that stockpile. And then if you, you can then assign specific information like the density of material type for that stockpile. So it's a quick way of um, measuring your stockpiles as well. So to summarize the benefits, what are the benefits of drone technology? Well, safer profiling, you can stand in one location uh, on the bench away from the inner workings of the quarry generally, away from much of the mobile plant. Uh, it can be a faster than laser profile as well, where if you're carrying out a laser profile required multiple steps, a uh, drone survey would be faster. You show from the trial that was carried out in Cornwall, there is an improvement in accuracy over lasers using a geo-referenced model. Using drones, we are capable of accurately measuring their faces in areas that would be inaccessible to a laser like behind tow buns, for example. And we can record geological features in a resulting model, which can then be visible in our blast design package. So we can help the shot fire determine the locations of holes or where we need to change the loading of the holes in that area of the survey. And there's a great tool as well to video blasts for post-blast review and carry out post-blast surveys to be able to monitor post-blast performance. And also quarry mapping surveys can now be performed from controlled locations rather than someone walking around with a GPS staff around stockpiles where they could be busy with um, loading shovels, driving around loading wagons or walking near around the active working areas where there's dump trucks and excavators operating. Unfortunately, there's always a downside to everything. And the downside to using drones, particularly in the UK, is the weather. As you can imagine, we can't use them in, in rain or heavy rain particularly and or strong winds as well. well. Thank you for listening. That's the end of my presentation. And has anyone got any questions? Liam, I'm, I'm curious, you showed a demonstration there for a single blast. Is it possible to survey multiple blasts simultaneously on the one flight? Uh, yes, what, well, carrying out a, a profile? Yes. You can do. Um, yeah, there's no reason why you can't do that. You'd probably be able to split up the resulting 3D model as well. Uh, we always just carry out one survey at a time. But I can't see there wouldn't be a reason why you wouldn't be able to carry out a survey um, with multiple blasts. Are you thinking blasts alongside each other or different areas of the quarry? Yeah, we can have a multiple blast locations on a single day in my operation. <clears throat> so it would be good to be able to fly the drone once and survey um, and profile, you know, three, four, five blasts at the same time. 
in that yeah, uh, the only problem would be with that is we're li- you're limited to flying a maximum distance of 500 meters from the pilot. So depending on where the other blasts are in the quarry, um, okay, might not be able to do that. And we also need to maintain line of sight with the drone as well. So I don't know, depends on the layout of the quarry, but that might not be possible either. No, but if that limitation wasn't there, it would be possible, yeah. Oh, you'd be able to create the 3D model, so you should be able to extract the relevant information for carrying out the profiles and the blast design. Perfect. Thanks, Liam. I'd probably advise, sorry, I'd probably advise to do them independently. But... Why is that? I just think it would be easier for processing. Um, I think it would, if computer, there's a lot of processing power involved in by. Uh, carry out a large survey because you have to ca- uh, survey a large area. Um, it might be too much for the uh, the software to handle. Right. Okay. Thanks for that. Liam, we have a question from Dave Skinner. What software is used by the drone? Uh, the photogrammetry software, I think it means. Uh, the photogrammetry software, uh, we use at EPC, we use Agisoft Metashape software. Which we then upload into our expertise blast design package. Any further questions? Hi, uh, Liam. It's uh, Ged Astia from Stabbing Rock. How does the survey actually pick up the whole marker pre drill and the holes post drill? You can either you can either visibly see the whole markers in your survey in the software, and you can pick them up that way, or you can uh, GPS in the whole markers. And then add them into your three D model. Okay, so so I'm understanding that you you would click on the on the whole markers from the survey in the software, and then you, you do, do it the same way. with the holes. Yeah, you can do it that way, or you can do it with a GPS. I, I prefer it, personally to do it in a GPS because I think it's more control. But we have done yeah. trials where we've spotted the holes in with a GPS and then clicked on them as well in the software and compared the two, and they'll. <laughs> Okay, understood. Okay. Mark from Dave Brook on the chat. How useful are the results for hazard assessment? Does it mean we're carrying out the um, the check sheets? We're thinking particularly of geotechnical hazard assessment in terms of stability. Um, in terms of stability? Uh, um. Well, it can be very useful, isn't it? If you've got a visual representation of what's going on on the bench, if you can see any joints or faults or bedding planes dipping out in the faces, um, yeah, you can see that in your model. So rather than kept just carrying out a visual inspection of the face, which you'd always do anyway, um, it, you'd still be able to do that in the blast design stage as well. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Another one for me, um, Mark. Um, what type of um, drone do you actually use for the survey? Uh, it's not not the wing tray, is it? It's no, what for the pro- carrying out the, the profiling? Profiling, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, DJI Phantom Four Pros, which I believe I think are being discontinued now. So we'll have to see which one, what else is out in the market. Okay. But you can use any drones really, and as long as it's got a, a decent camera. Um, Inbuilt GPS, which you all do. No, any branch probably work. Uh huh. Understood. Okay, thanks. Well, for everybody, thank you very much for taking time to give the presentation. It's much appreciated. And uh, thank you to everybody for joining. And um, have a good afternoon and speak soon. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day.